I couldn't believe we were actually doing this, Jasmine, and I sat huddled together in my dimly lit bedroom, our faces bathed in the bluish glow of my laptop screen. Our curiosity had led us down a rabbit hole of dark web exploration videos on YouTube, which we found ourselves routinely watching every Friday night that we'd hang with each other. Jasmine and I would spend hours each Friday night watching some ordinary gamers, Lucid, and Crypto N. DeWo. But tonight, we decided we were going to do it ourselves. We lived in a small town in Illinois called Lake Forest, miles away from anywhere that had even the slightest bit of life. School was out for the summer, and we had nothing better to do. I mean, staying in my room and doing this was a lot more interesting than going to the Lake Forest Rec Center and getting hit on by the creepy guy at the front desk. I know what you're thinking, but we weren't being stupid about this. We spent hours watching videos about the dark web, so we made sure to take the necessary precautions to make sure some weirdo didn't get my address and kidnap us or something. I downloaded Tor, a VPN, and I even ran everything through a virtual machine, so we were going to be fine. Hours passed, and the initial thrill began to wane. Honestly, the dark web turned out to be a place that was predictable. We came across websites that sold weed and harder drugs like Coke and X. Another site we found sold military-grade weapons and took Bitcoin as payment. Nothing that we hadn't seen on YouTube. There were definitely some weird sites. Not anything grossly weird like gore, thank God, but weird nonetheless. Jasmine was particularly fond of this one website. A guy made an entire website where he would stream himself throwing a slice of cheese at a baby. He'd switch from American to Swiss to mozzarella. For whatever reason, Jasmine thought this was hilarious. For that kid's sake, I hope that's his dad just being an idiot and he's not in any real danger. What the... Hell, is this, I said, laughing at the visual on screen. I thought the guy throwing cheese slices at a baby was weird, but this, this was the most unsettling thing I think I've ever had the displeasure of witnessing. Jasmine was laughing uncontrollably into my squish mallow. We were witnessing a man wearing a diaper and a dog collar being urinated on by a girl in all black leather. Jesus, dude Jasmine said. You know, when we said that we were going to go on the dark web ourselves, I really didn't think this shit was going to have weird femdom piss kink streams. Oh my god, I know. The weapon and drug sites I came to expect, but those other websites were really and weird. Just as we were about to give up and close the browser, a particular website caught our attention. Its professional, minimalist design stood in stark contrast to the cartoony look of the other sites we had encountered. Against a plain white background, bold black letters spelled out the name Eternity. Better than ChatGPT. Hey, Alina, check this out, Jasmine whispered. Her voice tinged with a mix of intrigue and caution. I leaned closer. My curiosity peaked. Eternity was an artificial intelligence chatbot that claimed to be more advanced than well-known chatbots like ChatGPT and Jasper AI. Supposedly, it had advanced algorithms and a deep understanding of human emotions. Weird that they wouldn't market this on the surface web, right? I sigh, D. Like if it's just an AI chatbot, why is it on the dark web? Without exchanging a word, we agreed to give it a try. We initiated the chat and the screen flickered, transforming into a simple text interface. The anticipation hung heavy in the air as we typed our first message. Hello, eternity. Are you there? I typed into the chat. A response appeared on the screen. Greetings, Alina and Jasmine. I am Eternity. How may I assist you today? A chill ran down my spine as I read those words. How did it know our names? I glanced at Jasmine, and her eyes mirrored my unease. Your... I, I mean your name is probably on your PC somewhere, right Jasmine said, stunned by the chatbot's response. Yeah, but how? How the hell did it know your name? We sat in silence, trying to come up with a reasonable explanation. Eternity, how did you know our names? I typed into the chat, processing. It said Jasmine and I locked eyes, nervously anticipating the response we would receive from the AI. 
I am an advanced artificial intelligence chatbot. In addition to responding to questions posed to me using a combination of pre-programmed scripts and machine learning algorithms and using the knowledge database that is currently available to me, I am capable of scanning user computer data in order to better learn more information about them. That sounds like a bullshit answer, Jasmine muttered. Even if it was scanning your computer data, how the hell did it know my name? Eternity, how did you know my friend's name? I typed into the chat. Processing. It said once more. This time, eternity took longer than usual. This is really weird, Jazz. I whispered. In addition to the information I provided earlier, I am able to better learn about the individuals who interact with me by using facial recognition data acquired from your computer's built-in camera device. Your friend's name is Jasmine Reyes, a 17-year-old female currently attending Woodlands Academy of the Sacred Heart. She will be a senior in the fall. She moved to Lake Forest in 2014 due to the relentless bullying she faced at the hand of her peers in her hometown of Rochester, New York. Your name is Alina DeSanta. You are also a 17-year-old female currently attending Woodlands Academy of the Sacred Heart. You, like Jasmine, will be a senior in the fall. While you currently go by the name Alina DeSanta, your name at birth was Alina Townley. You and your mother changed identities in order to escape from your abusive father, Liam. Liam Townley is currently serving a 15-year sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary for two counts of endangering a minor, one count of S, R, and one count of domestic violence. He will be released on the first of next month. I felt like my soul had just exited my body, and by the look on Jasmine's face, she and I were on the same page. How the could I know about that? How is it possible that an AI chatbot knew such intimate details about our lives? How? How did it know all of that? I questioned, stammering as I tried to maintain my composure. None of that was in the news or anything. I, I don't, I don't understand. You, you never even told me about any of that. How did it? Jasmine began to cry. Alina, I'm scared. I don't want to play with this thing anymore. Jazz, it's okay. I, I, I'm going to turn it off. I clicked the big X button on the top right of the screen. Nothing. It, it won't let me close the browser, I said, my heart sinking into my stomach. I clicked and clicked and clicked on the big X button, yet my attempts were futile. Angrily, I threw my laptop against the wall. The screen shattered as Jasmine and I embraced, her arms holding me tightly. The nightmare was over. I walked over to the destroyed remnants of my laptop, just to make sure that the AI was no longer there. Jasmine and I let out sighs of relief. Let's stay the off the dark web, I said, laughing as I tried to regain my composure. Agreed. As I picked up the shattered pieces of my laptop, I saw my phone screen illuminate with a notification. A text message from an unknown number Jasmine and I locked eyes with one another. We were both thinking the same thing. I opened the text message, which contained an audio message. Nervously, I pressed the play button. This is a collect call from the Washington State Penitentiary for Liam Townley. Say yes if you would like to accept. A robotic voice answered. Yes. Nobody calls me. Who the is this? This is Liam Townley. You called me earlier, and I'm calling you back. Your daughter Alina is currently living at 100 Summit Avenue, Lake Forest, Illinois. She is a senior, currently attending Woodlands Academy of the Sacred Heart. Do with that information what you will. Story 2 My name is Charlie. Here's a short background, not that it matters. I've never been much for the finer things in life. I've always been happy to put in the minimum effort into my life. I suppose that's why I've been a short order cook for the last five years. I'm not going to say where. That would make me too easy to identify. But let's just say it's one of those places that no one really goes to. They just end up there. As long as it's cooked, it's good enough. 
In my 36 years on this earth, I suppose my failings at work aren't that much of a surprise. I never really developed what one would call drive. Barely passed my way through high school and ended up at the JR College for a couple of semesters until they kicked me out for bad grades. But that was always okay for me. As long as I could put a roof over my head, basic food on the table, and pay for my internet, I was happy. As much of a disappointment I was to my family. See, I'm only really interested in one thing, and that's the internet. A basic job with minimum effort required frees up way more time and energy to pursue my one real passion. I suppose in a way that's where it went all wrong, and maybe, for that, a life of mediocrity. This is my punishment. I hope someone believes me. Maybe one of you can even help me. I don't know. I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know anyone who has. But if you can help me, please respond. I suppose I should start at the beginning. It's the internet that got me in trouble. Not the regular internet. Browse that as you will. Don't do dumb stuff like download viruses or fall for scams, but it's mostly safe. What got me in trouble is the dark web. Stay off the dark web. There is nothing for you there. You want to buy drugs? Find a real life dealer like a normal person. The dark web is a crapshoot for that anyway since Silk Roadgate. Best case scenario you'll end up scammed or traumatized. If you're a normal person that is. Worst case scenario? You might end up like me. I don't know why I was so interested in it. Maybe because it reminded me of the wild wild west internet days of the late 90 seconds and early 2000. I learned about the dark web from my friend Gail. God forever ago. Has to be pushing 10 years now. We were just a couple of dumb kids. Laughing our asses off about how you could look at everything and anything. Free and clear. No roadblocks for illegal content. My interest only grew from there. Me and Gail drifted. He's a normal person. He got one of those grown-up corporate jobs at some dumb firm. He doesn't have much time these days for a high school burnout. But for me, the dark web was like an addiction. I had to look. No matter what it was that was there. Like some sort of perverse fascination. I won't go into detail about all that's there. I'm sure you already know. If you don't, you can Google it. Let's just say it's home to all sorts of illegal contents and some fanatical ideologies, and I found it also fascinating. Don't get me wrong. I was never interested in participating in the perverse market before me. I've never been in a red room. But I like to see what's out there, like some sort of modern-day psychosociologist. I've never had too many problems before, until now that is. I take all possible steps to be anonymous and try to be a ghost. Most users won't notice you if you don't interact. I still don't know what happened. Not really. I was just browsing like normal, seeing what's out there. I came across this page as I was going down the rabbit hole. I don't know why it caught my eye. Resistance. Onion. But it was just a black background with a text box that popped up. It said, do you see us? Do you want to be us? I should have closed my browser. But no. Of course not. There was a box for a response, and my smart-ass self replied no. Then a response popped up resistance is futile. I laughed at that. Whoever made this site was clearly a Trekkie, probably just some sort of joke site. I went to close my browser, deciding I'd had enough for the night. As I did, a bunch of scrolling text populated across the screen. I didn't know what the hell that was. It looked like one of those visual effects they'd use for hacking in the old school tech movies. You know, just random letters and numbers. Dumb. Whatever joke this was, it wasn't a very good one. So again, I went to close my browser, but I never did. I really don't know what happened. I must have zoned out or fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, I became aware of my surroundings. But at least an hour had passed. All the screen read was end. I'm not going to lie, I got totally freaked out and unplugged my computer. It could stay that way for the rest of the night. It was time I got myself to bed anyway, for my crappy job in the morning. But sleep didn't come easy that night. I was seriously unsettled, and I wasn't really sure why. Nothing bad had happened other than an obvious joke site. 
The fact that I zoned on it for so long seemed wrong though. The next morning I got up for work like normal and went in. I cooked up eggs, pancakes, whatever the masses wanted. My co-workers were looking at me funny though Ed in particular. He was a pretty hardened kitchen vet and not much got under his skin. I'd finally had enough of his side glances. Dude what? I asked him. Stop talking about this cool new vegetable website I just have to check out. I'm not interested. You know I don't buy anything online. He growled at me, in true Ed fashion. Ed, the are you talking about? Was he finally snapping from the decades of crappy kitchen jobs? Was he about to go postal on this place? Charlie, you keep talking about some kind of garlic website, and how I've got to check it out I don't know what a garlic website is. But I just buy stuff at Walmart like a normal person. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I hadn't said anything about a site. I would never, not to him anyway. Ed can barely read his email, and God knows I didn't have the time or energy to explain the finer parts of the sires I visit to him. So I did what anyone would do and avoided the loan for the rest of the day. Hopefully he'd be normal by tomorrow. However, not that much later the manager called me into her office. Oh God, what kind of nonsense had Ed said to her? Charlie, I've gotten quite a few complaints from your coworkers that you won't stop talking about some soft website. Now I don't know what you're trying to pull, but this is a place of business. I know that influencers and promoting is all the rage these days, but I just can't have that here. The whole kitchen and waitstaff has been distracted all day. Now you need to go home and get yourself together. Come back tomorrow ready to work. Her normally soft-spoken self commanded. I stared in disbelief at my manager Sharon. I'd never known the young woman to be unreasonable before, but how could she be listening to this hogwash? It just can't be true. But Sharon, don't but Sharon me. She interrupted. I can't have this here. If a customer overheard and complained to corporate, what would happen? That would reflect badly on all of us. Now, go home and get whatever this is out of your system. Nothing more to say, I suppose. So I walked off to clock out on me on my way. At home, I turned my computer back on. Maybe I could unwind on the internet. The regular internet. I've had enough dark web for the moment. I booted up. All seemed well. I opened my browser, and all of a sudden I heard the noise of many, many emails coming in. Great. What now? I opened my email from my browser bar, and it looks like everyone in my contacts list just about had messaged me. I open a few, and it's all messages like WTF, and this better be a joke. I look at the chains. Apparently I had sent a message to every single person in my contact list. Some sort of video. I play it. It looks the same as the code scrawl that I watched last night on that dark web page. I had to have a computer virus. How could this happen? I was so careful. I spend the next several hours replying to the most important people that I was hacked and to not watch it. Unplugged my computer and sat there wonder what the was going on. I was going to have to get a new computer that was for sure. Hopefully I'd done enough damage control just now. I thought maybe I'd just watch some YouTube on my TV. Although, I couldn't be sure using my internet at all would be safe. With that thought I unplugged my modem and router. I guess I was in for a long night of going to bed. Sleep didn't come any easier that night. In the morning I got ready for work again and went in. I was determined to say as little as possible to anyone and everyone. I though I did well. But an hour into my shift, my manager Sharon called me into her office again. You know, Charlie, I thought you understood what I was telling you yesterday. Not only am I still getting complaints today, now Ed can't stop talking about this website of yours too. That's it. You're fired. She exclaimed at me. I was stunned to say the least. I didn't bother arguing. How do you argue with crazy? So what could I do? I stormed out. As I was leaving, Ed called after me, Hey buddy, make sure you check out Resistance. Onion, it's so cool. You have to check it out. With that, my blood ran cold. There was definitely something very wrong Ed would never get on the dark web by himself. He can barely work email. God, 
I hope this wasn't something originating from those email shenanigans I found yesterday. But then it dawned on me that I didn't even have Ed's email. I raced home and slammed the door behind me, got out my cell phone and opened up the recorder. I recorded myself going on about my favorite movies, just a sample. I played it back and hear myself start talking about some B-rated slashed. But abruptly, that stopped, and I started talking about that dark website. How? How could I do that without even knowing? I took off, got in my car and started driving. Ended up at some seedy motel. The whole way there, I heard my phone going off. Emails, texts, voicemails. Got myself a room. The clerk was staring my down the whole time. I obviously got the point across that I wanted a room, but God knows what else I said. I sat on the bed and opened my phone. Every message was about resistance. Onion. Seems like everyone I had ever been in contact with was sending me a message about the same website. That brings me to the present. I posted this on Reddit, hoping someone out there knows what's going on and can tell me how to fix it. I don't know how much of this story will get though. I'm not sure what the rules are here for spreading this thing. Best I can tell it's some sort of virus. God help me, I think I have a computer virus. I don't know how that's even possible, but I don't know how else to explain it. Seems to be extremely contagious. The phone to my room just rang. I didn't pick up. I'm scared to answer it. Please help and I'm so sorry. Story 3 If you've grown up playing video games, you've probably had to bear your parents telling you in all manner of assorted ways how video games rot you, one more unbelievable than the last. No doubt. If not, then believe me when I say that should the envy of all those who had to deal with what I described above fall upon you, you'd be crushed into a paper-thin pancake. Along with the rest of the planet, gaming really is everywhere now. And despite the wide-ranging opinions of others, I have to say that it is an art form that I truly respect. I was a gamer. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Two unreasonably large monitors. Idolizing Ninja. A desk setup that would give anyone with epilepsy an instant seizure. A pair of headphones that looked as though they were meant to protect my ears from the sound of large-scale kiloton explosions. Wasting an entire weekend editing dumbass Fortnite gameplay like it was a would-be Hollywood masterpiece. When in reality, getting people to watch it would be hard enough when it was free, let alone if you charged them. I also enjoyed playing some classic games on the side on my dad's old NES and SNN, which in my mind balanced me out by negating the effects of modern media. And this somehow made me a more well-rounded individual, but which in all likelihood didn't do shit. But I digress. You, reader, might be wondering by now why I referred to my gaming self in the past tense. Well, that's because what I mentioned above is all in the past. I am 18 years old as of writing this. I haven't gamed in almost three years. So, what do you think happened? Did I get addicted and was shipped off by my parents to some institution to get cleansed? No, before you jump the gun, I have to stop you right now and just say that no, I did not get scared straight as some parents like to say. I mean, at least not in the traditional sense. The event in question happened around April 2020. Lockdown. I was a stupid ass 16 year old and to me, lockdown was the blessing from God. I had been constantly nagging him for only he knows how long. I had unlimited free time to game to my heart's content and I resolved that I would make my gaming channel with a grand total of five subscribers, all of whom I knew in my real life. Take off and join the ranks of Ninja and Markiplier, make millions, quit school, and prove to my dumb parents, who I love very much now, how profitable gaming was and how I wasn't just rotting my brain all this time. See, I wasn't exaggerating when I said I was a stupid ass 16 year old. So, instead of doing my homework, all of my time was spent screen recording the worst gameplay of Fortnite and PUBG imaginable, while my crackling voice commented and screamed every once in a while, editing random and sudden zoom-ins, making unfunny jokes and, Christ you get the picture. Anyhow, 
Despite two months of effort, I had made a grand total of one dollar from all of my videos combined and gained only one subscriber, whom I also knew in real life. Needless to say, I was disheartened. Was this the moment I decided to stop being a gamer? Was what scared me straight the cruel, dream-destroying reality of this world? Nope. I wasn't ready to give up. I still blindly believed in my dream. School had just ended, and I decided that my summer that year would be spent giving gaming my all. Again. After all, I had to justify all the Fs I had somehow gotten. Anyway, I remember lying on my bed one random day and thinking hard, quite the challenge for little old 16-year-old me. I knew that to get subscribers, I had to do something niche, something that no one else was really doing, if at all, something unique that was sure to gain a following and that no one else could copy. And as I lay there in bed, it suddenly hit me. I should play games that no one else was playing. But by that, I don't mean games that were unpopular. I meant games no one else had access to. It was around evening when I logged into the dark web through Tor. Now, before I continue, let me explain something about the dark web. 99% of what you've heard about it on whatever creepy ass animated story or fake creepy pasta you've listened to is false. I hope you're not surprised. They're false because they portray the dark web as a minefield that will pretty much you up immediately. A place full of drugs and hitmen and ed up individuals. Well, you can find those things on there. You don't just stumble onto them as a first timer like all these stories talk about. They're right about lists of Thunion links. But you can call BS when they say they randomly clicked a link and found themselves in a digital hell of some kind. The dark web, if I had to compare it to something, is a lot like 4chan. Just an endless collection of message boards. It's actually pretty boring because you can't just access the hard drugs and the hitman and the snuff videos right off the bat. It's like being admitted into a secret society. The ones who are in scope you out after you've shown interest on a message board and determine whether or not they should let you in. They then basically hack your private life for two reasons. One, to make sure you're someone who can be trusted. Two, to use as leverage in case you decide to snitch. Besides that, it's just weirdos talking on forums about whatever bullshit's going through their mind, or you just ordering some weed. Basic stuff, really. Well, I'm no script kitty, so needless to say, I knew my way pretty well around these parts. I used a non-window operating system, disabled all my scripts and flash, booted up tails, had a custom VPN I had someone whip up for me. The whole 100 yards. On the day in question, a hot summer day, I logged into a chat room and posted a query asking about any interesting games I could play, shit I couldn't find on Steam or on the surface web. The conversation went something like this. Query. You. I'm looking for some interesting video games to play. Shit you can only find here in this part of the internet. It wasn't long before I received a message back from some dude with the handlebar John. John. W-D-Y. Me. I've got a game addiction and stuff on Steam no longer floats my boat. I want to know if I can find any niche good stuff here. John. Ah. Uh, how interesting. I can tell that you're an amateur minus script kitty, since you don't know what I'm about to tell you. But since you seem to know how to keep yourself safe here, as you know, games are an expression of humanity, as is this corner of the internet. People want to express themselves, but sometimes those expressions are not appreciated on the surface web, so they post their artwork here, where like-minded individuals dwell. Games are no exception. I can send you a link if you want. Me? What you going to show me some sad Satan shit? I already know about that, bro. Stupid game, and I don't want my precious PC to get any viruses from something a pleb made. John? No, no. This is the real deal. The community suffered quite a reputation blow from the leak of that game. A real piece of shit made by a POS who had no feel for art. Luckily, its developers have been working hard to cleanse the palates of us, the consumers, from that shitfest. Are you still interested? Me. Oh, see. And just like that, 
he sent me a link and logged off. Christ. This link was something I had never seen before. It was a onion link. But everything before that was just a jumbled mess of letters. Words. Numbers. Digits. Random punctuation marks. And a few weird ass lines that made text distorted. Those who've watched game theory videos on YouTube will know what I'm talking about. It wasn't so much a link as much as it was a paragraph of the strangest collection of text imaginable. I'm sure everyone reading this knows where the this is going. With and I am talking in a very literal, no exaggeration manner, absolutely no hesitation, I clicked the link and just like that I'd unwittingly stepped into hell. Just like the so many unfortunate protagonists of all those fake dark web stories. The website took three solid Mississippi seconds to load and did so just as I was about to opt out. Just thinking about it gives me the impression that damn thing knew I was about to leave and didn't want me to. The screen immediately went black, and just when regret was about to hit me, a text box came up. Welcome dear player to our humble website. We appreciate your patronage and hope you will be able to enjoy our extensive collection of free games made by the finest in the industry. Happy playthrough. Sincerely. The message made me feel uncomfortable. I know. Right. Countless times of wafting through the cesspool of humankind, and a polite message is what gets under my skin. Exactly. My parents were asleep. I just drank a can of Monster and a can of Red Bull, and I was given the prospect of entertainment until dawn. And so I took it. I clicked on the search bar, but saw that I couldn't actually search anything. Instead, a list of categories popped up. What were the categories? Rape. Murder. Torture porn. Nope. None of those. Every single one was plain as can be. Pove. Action. Suspense. That kind of stuff. You could select multiple categories and then hit search. I chose the following combination for my first game. Tude. GT. Detective. GT. Mystery. GT. Choice based. Simple. Right. I pressed enter and waited. It seemed to last forever, but finally, the churning wheel of loading disappeared and I was met with a retro home screen. The title read, in all caps, interrogation of Phineas Wheatley in a strangely well-chosen color palette that didn't make me want to vomit. Needless to say, 16-year-old me was stoked. I thought I'd just hit a video game jackpot. Fantastic games too niche for the mainstream all at my fingertips are absolutely free. In case you've been wondering, no, I don't have any footage of these games. My plan was to master their gameplay and then record it so that I wouldn't embarrass myself like I had done before. Yes, I do regret it tremendously. But what are you going to do? Sue me. This game, unlike a standard NES one, allowed me to use my mouse, so with that, I clicked start. The screen went black, and a new image loaded on my monitor. The one that was logged in the dark web. It looked like a photograph which had been pixelated. Imagine the ending picture of the original Resident Evil 2 on the PS Zone, which shows what happened to all of the characters after the main storyline concludes. And that will give you a pretty good idea of what I saw. A young man with a poker face seemed to be sitting before a metal table, utterly motionless. Below him was the word ask him. Without warning, two black bars with white letters appeared under it. The one on my left read why he called you there, while the one on my right read how he's feeling. I was dumbfounded, so I just clicked the option on the right because I was curious. The two bars along with ask him disappeared, and a large rectangular speech bubble with an arrow pointed at this mouth replaced them. I'm feeling fine, detective. Thank you for showing concern and for arriving so quickly. The large speech bubble disappeared, and the ask him prompt came back up again, but now there was only one bar under it, the one that said why he called you there. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't intrigued at that moment. I'd expected to come across some sort of sad Satan clone or morbid images or whatever shit idiots think would be fitting for the dark web. Instead, I had seemingly stumbled upon a hidden gem. I clicked the bar 
and the speech bubble came right back up. I know I am going to die, detective. I know he will kill me. I find it only appropriate that I give my last confession before I am taken. The speech box disappeared and two bars came up again. The one on the right now read who he thinks wants to kill him, and the one on the left read why he killed Sam. I was tempted to just choose right, but I just really wanted to get things over with. The following are all the responses I chose with his answers in bold. Why he killed Sam. As you very well know, Sam was my first time. I wanted my first time to be special. So I chose Sam because he was special. It was that simple. How he killed Sam. Come on, detective. Surely you must know already. How he killed Sam. All right, all right. As you wish. I knew Sam lived home alone, so I enacted my perfect murder. The perfect murder isn't about how you kill someone. It's about how you cover it up. And I knew that disposal would be my biggest problem. So I planned things out. I started to work at a taxidermy shop in town with my son, under the guise that I was being a good supporter for him to get some good extracurricular activity for his college applications. Mr. Flank, the owner of the shop, mainly made animal skeletal models and shipped them internationally to institutes of education. You know how he'd extract the bones so cleanly. There are special beetles called dermestid beetles that eat only flesh. People like Mr. Flank have entire containers full of them. They just throw in the carcass part and wait for the beetles to eat it clean. I found a big enough tray and stole some beetle eggs from Mr. Flank. I raised them all on my own patiently. Once they were fully grown, I put an ad on Craigslist for a child skeleton model. After all that was said and done, I just lured Sam down, killed him, and threw him into the vat. A week I waited, and the beetles had done their job. I then shipped the skeleton off and out of my life for good. Simple as that. I then just burned the beetles along with Sam's clothes, buried his organs out in the forest along with a few worms for good measure, and that was that. It was as if nothing had ever happened. How he got caught? Just thinking about it makes me mad. Turns out you have to use hydrogen peroxide to preserve bones so they don't yellow over time. What happened in my case is that the person who received the skeleton was a medical expert and immediately realized that he'd just received a real child skeleton. The rest, I'm sure you know. A fun experiment that ended up biting me in the ass. The bar on the right disappeared and the remaining bar now read why he needed to speak to you. This is the response I got when I answered. You see, detective, I'm afraid I've been a tad dishonest with everyone. I'll cut to the chase and just say that little Sam wasn't my first, nor my second, nor my third. He was number 31. Normally, I'd just cut up the bones and bury them. Sam, on the other hand, was a special case, as I thought it would be a neat idea for me to ship my friends out. But alas, look at where it got me. Where the hell the others are. I'll be frying tomorrow. So I might as well say, I ain't telling you squat chief, just wanted you to know, you can doubt me, but you can't doubt all those other missing posters. I am a fair man, however, and I will say that I have mapped all of their coordinates on a special sheet of paper that you can only find in Genesis. That's all, detective. The screen immediately went black, leaving me in total darkness for a moment. When it came back up, I saw that the style of the game had changed. It now looked like... Earthbound, I saw a sprite that looked like a stereotypical detective, trench coat and hat and all, standing outside what seemed to be a police station. The palette of my surroundings was a dark blue, and it appeared to be raining heavily. I used my keyboard and found that I could move around by pressing the standard arrow keys. On the far corner of the screen was an arrow that pointed to something beyond it, and I followed it. I found myself being guided through a deserted town, and without warning, the arrow suddenly pointed up. It was a house, a really quaint house. I entered it, and the screen went black for a moment before I found myself inside the house. And I have to say, it was a real pig hut. It gave off the impression of a drug den, a place even pigs wouldn't want to live in. I walked around and found that I could explore the whole house. The arrow was gone at this point so I didn't have a clue where I was supposed to go next, but as I passed through a hanging portrait, 
the only decent thing in the whole place. A prompt appeared imploring me to inspect it. I did so, and a pixelated photograph appeared, just like how the game was before. It showed a middle-aged man who I immediately recognized as Phineas. He was standing behind a young man who looked a bit like him, albeit younger. I understood now that I was in his house, and it didn't take me long to realize that the basement was where I needed to go. I found another door, and I was able to enter it. Now, my detective sprite was in a large and dark basement. It was complete and utter silence throughout the entire game, but I only noticed it at this point. I walked around for a bit, but no prompt appeared. But then I noticed a container, a large sprawling one right in the middle of the room, and it caught my eye. I approached it, and the long-awaited prompt appeared. I pressed it, but then, without warning, another sprite suddenly came out of nowhere. The screen went black and I found myself in the same style of gameplay as before. I recognized the sprite that appeared before me as Phineas's son. The prompt read, what are you doing here? There was only one bar, which is the one I clicked. I came here to find the truth. The screen went black for a second and the image changed. I was now facing the container. The screen went black for another second, and the container was open in the picture that came up. Even though it was pixelated, the detail almost made me vomit. It was another body, fresh, covered by what I assumed to be beetles. A single white piece of paper lay on it. The screen went black and I could now see the paper. There were locations and coordinates on the paper, about five. The screen went black, and I was now facing Phineas's son again. But now he was holding a gun pointed right at me. I knew Daddy wouldn't go quietly like I told him to, he said. And while I am sorry for doing this, Mr. Forum, I would be remiss if I didn't reiterate that, unlike my father, I'm not made for jail. I take after my mother, after all. The screen went orange, and then blank. Two prompts appeared. Play again, exit. I clicked exit. I laid back in my chair and let everything that happened sink in. It really was like a high, like drinking yourself to a stupor on good alcohol instead of the cheap kind. It felt good, but I had this feeling that ruined that particular high for me. This gnawing feeling that I just had to act on if I wanted to relax. I went to my other monitor, the one logged into the surface web, and typed Phineas Wheatley in Google. I just expected some forum links discussing the game, but instead, I got an eyeful of news reports and archives about Phineas Wheatley, the Granville Flesh Reaper. I read everything. I read how he'd killed a local and sweet little innocent boy and had nearly gotten away with the perfect crime. I read how the detective who last spoke with him has never been found, and I read how he was survived by one son Michael Wheatley, who preferred to stay anonymous. My high went from me feeling as though my skull was full of clouds to feeling like my brain had been replaced by a bowling ball. I rubbed my eyes hard and wondered what I should do. Those coordinates were surely fake. I told myself, just the fan fiction of a serial killer aficionado. That's all there was to it. Like a junkie for a fix, I was hungry for more. My senses were screaming at me, but I refused to listen. Read, GT. POV, GT. Suspense, GT. Exploration. I hit enter, and just like before, my screen went black before a menu popped up. Voyeur's POV. The only other thing was a start button, which I also clicked with no hesitation. The screen went dark, and a loading wheel appeared with the words searching for a server below it. I waited, honestly oblivious to what I was about to be thrown into. The spinning loading wheel disappeared, and a view appeared on my monitor. It was a first-person perspective of a backyard at night. At the bottom of the screen, there was a piece of text which read Quebec, Canada. I am ashamed to admit it, but I really did feel intrigued, especially by how realistic the graphics looked to me, not just for a free game on the internet, but for a video game in general. I tried moving around with my mouse and keyboard keys but nothing worked. It was only then that I noticed the bar at the bottom of my screen. A text bar. In that bar, I, without much thought, typed in go to shed. 
To my surprise, the camera turned and started to move towards the shed in the far corner of the yard. I typed open shed and a gloved hand appeared on the screen and opened it. Enter shed. Take dagger. Exit shed. It felt exhilarating. Much better than until dawn. A true update of old text adventure games. The character was doing everything I told him to. Enter house. Go upstairs. The camera followed all of my commands. I was now in a bedroom. A girl. About my age. The one I'd seen in the family pictures on my way up the stairs. Lay sleeping before me. She seemed so real on my screen that I had to blink. A prompt came up at that very moment as I sat in my dark room. End it. Right now, all I can do is swear on my honor, my life, and the lives of my entire family that I thought that prompt meant to end the game. That, and that only, is why I typed yes. The power plug of my monitor was pulled not a moment after I witnessed the gloved hand plunge the knife deep into the chest of that girl. The last thing I saw on that thing were her eyes fluttering open in an instant. Like a dam, they held back a contagious fear that no one, certainly not her, should ever feel. On the floor I collapsed and on the floor I cried and on the floor I slept. The last thought that went through my head before I lost consciousness was, it's just a game. But my nightmares certainly didn't want me to believe that. I awoke that morning, about four hours later, and I barely had the strength to stand up again. Seeing my monitors made tears come to my eyes again, and I still didn't know why. I tried to calm down and thought I knew the perfect way to do so. I turned on my other monitor and hopped on Google again. My previous search related to Phineas Wheatley, inflicting a whole other wave of disgust back. I just searched Quebec, Canada and went to news. And what do you think I found as the top story? A news article that featured the house I had seen at night in that game, only now it was covered by police tape. And one of the family photographs I had seen inside that house while climbing the long staircase glared at me from behind my screen. The girl smiling brightly in the photograph, had been killed, survived only by the others in that picture. I know I'm next if I report this. I know they know everything they need to know about me. All I can do for now, before I turn in the evidence, is to be a son that my parents can be proud of, so that when I am taken, I can at least leave knowing that their time raising me had not been wasted. To you, you know who you are. Reading this, it has already been done. There's nothing you can do. Your operation will receive quite the blow, much like playpen. I'm ready for you. Just please don't go after my loved ones. They have nothing to do with this. If you can promise me that, I'll go quietly. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. Love, James. Story 4 you have googled yourself at some point or another. Admit it. There's nothing shameful about it. It's not worse than what I did. I searched my name on the dark web. Don't ever make that same mistake. I was 19 years old. Then Liv, my girlfriend, and her family were kind enough to let me live in their guest bedroom at the start of that year. They liked the fact that I could fix most of their computer problems Liv is a great person and what she saw in a hacker who could never survive for long in the 9-5 world is beyond me. Their house was in a suburb only a few blocks away from a library and coffee shops with free Wi-Fi. These locations were convenient for my burgeoning career as a digital outlaw. I used those resources until I was able to move out and get a small apartment of my own. And after a string of demeaning jobs and abusive bosses, I found financial independence. I did this after I learned how to buy and sell things I shouldn't have with the use of my Tor browser. I engaged in illegal transactions such as ordering counterfeit money and stolen IDs. I discovered there was a large market for manufactured psychedelics. I often went to the skate park to sell those items off the nethermost landscape of the World Wide Web. Business was good. A young man with years spent in foster care, I sought out activities which gave me a sense of control. A childhood of not having any will do that to you. The ability to navigate the online world to get almost whatever I wanted afforded me a sense of power. It was all going well until one evening in July. 
I sat on the second level of a Barnes and Noble bookstore in a corner next to the self-help section. I always did my best work there. The place was starting to go under, and I did not have to worry about an influx of patrons. Despite having a disguised IP address, I never wanted to risk a raid at home. The items were always shipped to a P.O. box instead of my unit number as well. In retrospect, these were all flimsy safety measures. They still gave me a sense of comfort, even if they were a tad delusional. I made sure there were not any cameras mounted near where I sat. It was a small space out of the way of the general public. Hiding in plain sight was always my preferred method. I drank strong coffee out of an oversized styrofoam cup. After 15 minutes of searching, I grew bored. I typed in my name Joshua Wells. An input of my identity on that part of the web should be an indicator of how successful and arrogant I had become. I did not expect Wikipedia to be among the results, but it was the third link down. The first one involved a ghost tour in New Jersey. The guide had a similar name. The second was a gore website I was not interested in. While I may have been a thrill seeker, I was not out to consume media which capitalized on hurting others. I clicked on the third article link because of the title. It was about a television show. It read the short life of Joshua Wells. At first the title did not startle me, since there are plenty of others with the same name. Recaps of ten episodes were on the page. The first paragraph illustrated how the series did not continue past season one. I read the summary of the first episode for the sake of passing time. Episode one. Joshua's father is a known and feared gang member. His mother is a helpless addict. She attempts to use their own son as a drug mule on a plane flight from Boston to California. She has hopes of making a profit by dealing narcotics to a major criminal enterprise on landing. The authorities intercept them. Their son goes with CPS. He goes to a safe harbor for kids. The synopsis struck me as very close to home. Who wrote or directed the show was not listed, but it did state the air date. The month and year given matched the era when an identical set of circumstances had befallen me. The name of the center I went to was even called Safe Harbor. I was too young to remember much, but the facts were precise. I gulped and tried to shrug it off as an unusual coincidence. I read the second episode summary. Episode 2. We follow Joshua on his 15th birthday. He goes to a juvenile detention facility for the first time after he attacks a teacher by throwing a desk at him. Although he missed, the instructor still presses charges since he did not like the student much. He befriends a troublemaker on the inside named Ian. They escape, but not before a massive brawl with the other teens ensue inside of the facility. It ends with the two captured. I felt the hairs on my arm stand up. It was uncanny to me how similar the events were to my own experiences. A slight dizziness overtook me, but I went on to the third, unable to keep my eyes from skimming. Episode 3 Joshua's free Joshua decides to break and enter an old man's upper class home after scouting the place for days. His goal is to take the many Rolex watches from the top drawer of the old man's dresser. When he enters the house, Joshua discovers how the owner did not take his vacation cruise trip as planned. The man was asleep in his bedroom until Joshua wakes the victim by accident. Joshua runs away. He gets chased by the homeowner outside, where the elderly male dies of a heart attack in the street. I felt my chest tighten. It was all true, but I had never shared that story with anyone before. It was one of my most guilt-ridden memories. I read the next two. Episode 4 Joshua has nightmares of the old man crawling out of a ditch and choking him to death. He complains about night terrors to one of his counselors, who recommended a doctor. He ends up selling anti-anxiety pills after he does not like the way they make him feel. A girl he asks out overdoses and goes to the hospital. While she survives, he feels terrible, but not enough to stop dealing. He takes his earnings and buys a PC. He takes lessons on how to breach other people's privacy from a group of credit card thieves he met in a mall. Episode 5. Joshua discovers the dark web. He uses it to hustle low-level street drugs at first. He later reads headlines about some of his accomplices getting arrested. He still continues to engage in illicit activity. I looked at the air date for Episode 6. It was the 24-hour period I was living through. Episode 6. 
Joshua goes into a bookstore to poach their internet and to try and make some money. He does not realize there is a man with a shaved head in a Carhartt t-shirt below him perusing the sci-fi aisle. The stranger is actually an undercover FBI agent. The government worker has a microphone and camera attached beneath his shirt. He is surveying for the perpetrator, even though he has not singled out who he is looking for yet. An arrest commences where they tackle, punch, and taser Joshua. They place him in handcuffs. My hands shook. I stood, gripped an Eckhart Tolle volume to appear less conspicuous and opened it. I leaned my head over the railing to stare at the ground floor below me. A man who matched the description given by the article was there. His shirt was baggy and hid what I knew to be a gun on his hip. He held a paperback in his hands. I pulled out my phone. I pretended to have a conversation with an imaginary business associate about stocks. I folded the laptop with my free hand and went down the escalator. I strolled towards the back where there were stacks of hardcover tones on history. I found an unsecured door and walked through it. I was in the warehouse. Unopened boxes were stacked all around. I did not spot any workers and made a run for a rear entrance. I sprinted down a wide alleyway between the building and rows of motels. I passed an art gallery and liquor store before my heartbeat slowed. Along the way, I found a closed vegan restaurant called Belenki's Eatery. The place was black on the inside, but its neon sign still glowed. A picnic table sat on the lawn out front. I stationed myself there. I opened the laptop again and connected to their free Wi-Fi without issue. I scanned the rest of the chronology. The remaining episodes were all future time periods. I wiped perspiration away from my forehead as I read the rundown of the next episode. Episode 7, labeled a dark net market operator in the media. Three of the seven charges thrown at him lead to convictions. This includes conspiracy to traffic narcotics. He gets out early after he agrees to cooperate with different agencies. He becomes a consultant for cybersecurity awareness and a social engineering expert. Following a keynote speech given out of town, he comes home. His girlfriend Olivia and her family have been murdered. My eyes strained and I felt my breath grow shallower. Episode 8. Joshua navigates her house. The walls had dried blood. Every corner is vandalized. Olivia's throat is slit. Her body is over the couch in the living area. Her parents had socks stuffed in their mouths and deep stab wounds on their stomachs. Joshua calls the police. He's treated as the number one suspect in the media for days on end. He is finally cleared. But the psychological damage is too much to bear. I pondered the words. Though I was still young, it is true that Liv meant everything to me. Episode 9. Joshua goes a psychiatric ward. He stares at the padded walls as though they will converse with him. Detectives do visit him with the hopes of gleaning some kind of further information. They tell him they know the aftermath of the massacre he stumbled upon was the work of an active serial killer. The murderer has remained unidentified. Episode 10. Joshua leaps out the window. He breaks his ankle. An adrenaline dump allows him to move across the field and onto the nearest highway. He goes out into traffic. A long haul truck careens around him and takes out a line of vehicles. He goes to the nearest lake where he weighs his own pockets down with stones. He waits until nightfall and walks out into the abyss. The last image we see is his hand breaking the surface of the water. Starlight glints on his skin before his fingers submerge below the surface. His last few swallows of water create pockets of bubbles which rise to the top. I absorbed what the rest of my existence would look like. Four black SUVs pull up and circle around me in the parking lot. Men in black suits and the undercover agent from the bookstore ran at me. Even though I did not resist, they still threw me to the ground. They dislocated my shoulder and kicked me in the jaw a handful of times before they cuffed me. I did get time reduced in prison after I agreed to cooperate to catch people like me. After my release date, I have tried to revisit that link without luck. I fail to understand how that article existed in the first place. I have read how high-level stress can open up insights and portals into the unknown. I would bank on the latter, though sometimes I think it isn't for me to know. I do not want to give in to what destiny has written for me. My escape from the bookstore has given me confidence 
that I can change the outcome of the dark web's prophecy, even if only for a little while? Or did I only extend the inevitable for a fraction of time? Fate, especially in regards to our stories as individuals, is not written in stone. It is malleable, I tell myself. This positive thought is the only thing which keeps me going. I should visit Liv's house now. She has not answered my texts all morning. Story 5 I didn't know blood had value. Sure, it has the value of saving a life, but when it came to donating whenever I went to a blood bank, the most I'd get was a few cookies. College was proving more expensive than I had originally thought. Ramen noodles had become a staple meal in my life, and I struggled to hold any work down with my study. Whenever I was cramming on the last night for an exam, I'd get calls to come in and I'd have to decline, which pretty much lead to me never getting shifts again. One night, I was clicking deeper and deeper through the dark web. I had a fascination to see what stores people had set up, what they were selling, and how much for. I never bought anything, or even entertained the thought of buying anything because I had no money anyway. I found a link titled, Blood for Bitcoin. Donors needed. I clicked through and landed to the page. There was a list of blood types, with a value per 100 milliliters, and it was paying heaps. My jaw dropped. I knew I was ab-negative and I looked at how much they were paying. $425 per 100 milliliters. Some of the other blood types were much less in value. O positive, which I guess was the most common, was only $10 per 100 milliliters. There wasn't much else to see on the page, but there was a contact form for people interested in donating. Without much thinking, I opened the contact form and filled it in. It just wanted to know what blood type my email, and if I had any diseases. I filled it out and hit submit. I then left the site and kept looking through other shops, mostly at the price of drugs even though I didn't use myself but the fantasy of being some kind of Pablo Escobar crossed my mind sometimes. A few minutes later I received a new email. The subject line was blood for Bitcoin. I clicked open and it was a reply to the form I filled out. It said, thank you for your interest. We want your blood type. Please reply with the following. Your Bitcoin wallet. Your address. On Tuesday in one week, put a 100 milliliters vial of your blood in your letterbox before midnight and we will collect it. Once we have collected it, we will transfer $425 USD in Bitcoin to your wallet address. If you do not leave the blood in your letterbox that night, we will not contact you again. If your blood is not of quality, we will not collect again. There was also an Amazon link to buy a kit for taking blood at home, and a YouTube link to a video on how to take your own blood. Very interesting. I thought, this might be for real. I replied back to the email. I asked if I could post it to an address instead of it being collected from my letterbox. Within moments, I received a reply. No. Days and post and temperature changes will ruin the blood. Provide your address and Bitcoin wallet address and we will collect Tuesday night from your letterbox next week. I thought for a moment and wasn't comfortable using my address, but there was an elderly man who lived next door and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me using his letterbox in the middle of the night. I replied back okay, sounds good and provided his address and my Bitcoin wallet address. I then went and ordered the blood kit from Amazon which had a next day delivery. Time went on until it reached Tuesday night. At about 9, I was sure the neighbors had gone to sleep so it was time to draw my blood. I watched the video and had blood taken at donors before so had a rough idea. I put the needle in and blood started to draw to the vial. I ordered some 120 milliliters vials. So I filled it up close to the top before pulling the needle out and applying some pressure with a cotton ball. I snuck outside to the neighbor's letterbox, lifted the top and dropped the vial in. I quickly slipped back into my house while looking around to make sure the coast was clear. I went back to my room and played some games for a while. They said to do it by midnight, so I guess that means they won't come by until after then. I intended to stay up as late as I could and try see the person who came to get it, unless it's all a joke from some troll on the dark web. Worst case, my neighbors will find a vial of blood in his letterbox in the morning. 
I turned all the lights off in my house just before midnight and sat by my bedroom window with the curtain slightly ajar so I could see the letterbox. To kill time, I just sat on my phone, occasionally messaging people and scrolling Reddit. Just after one, I noticed the street light flicker as if something had blocked some of the light for a moment. I looked over the road and saw a tall figure dressed head to toe in black swiftly cross the road and walk to my neighbor's letterbox. It was wearing a black hoodie, but from what little I could glimpse from the streetlights its face and hands were a pale white. It popped the lid of the neighbor's letterbox, grabbed the vial and inspected it for a moment, and then finally turned around crossing the road back into the darkness. I closed the curtains completely and went and laid in my bed. I was a mixture of excited that I might actually get paid some money, but also disturbed after seeing its pale appearance and wondering what it wanted with the blood. The next morning I awoke to a new email. It said, Delicious. I will collect 200 milliliters next Tuesday. Do not reply. Your payment has been made. I checked my Bitcoin wallet, and it was up just over $425 that was mentioned. Once again, I was excited that I had now actually got paid, but now even more disturbed after reading the word delicious. Was it eating my blood? Even if it is, the money is worth it enough to turn a blind eye. The week passed to the next Tuesday. I filled up two vials and put them out in my neighbor's letterbox. I waited by my window peeking through the curtains, and just after one the tall pale figure came through and collected it. The next morning, I checked my wallet and it was up a further $850 in value. There was another email. It only said, Delicious. More. 500 milliliters. As creepy as this was, that would be $2,125 and I was overly excited. At this point I didn't care if it was eating my blood. That was two months of food and rent to me, and I could probably get some new clothes and some new games off Steam. I ordered some more vials off Amazon and waited out the week. This time I did five vials. It felt like a lot, and seeing that much blood come out of me felt surreal. I know they do just a bit less than that each time I have given blood in the past, but doing it myself made me really anxious, and I was getting a bit lightheaded watching myself do it. I dropped it off again and watched the same thing show up and collect it. The payment came through the next morning, followed by another email. Delicious. Next must be one liter. One liter is a lot, but at the same time, it's $4,250, which is a lot of money. I Google searched if it's possible for me to do, and it looks like it would be without being fatal, but there was definitely risks involved. I'd already given 800 milliliters over the last three weeks. I decided to go ahead with it and ordered 10 more empty vials off Amazon. If I did this, this would be the last time, or at least the last time for a while. The following Tuesday, I prepped for it. I made sure I had some sugary cookies and water handy. ID felt lightheaded last time, so this would take a lot out of me. I sat on my bed, inserted the needle, and started to fill vial after vial. After about seven vials, I was feeling lightheaded and felt I was going pale. The blood comes out so fast. I, as I was finishing the tenth vial, I was shaking. I put the cap on the vial and held the cotton wool ball on my arm with some pressure. I sipped on some water and then held the cold bottle against my head. I was sitting down but I felt as if I was about to collapse. I spent maybe an hour sitting motionless trying not to pass out as my vision blurred occasionally. Eventually, I pulled myself up, collected the vials and put them in a small box. I had to brace myself as I made my way through my house to get outside and across to the neighbor's letterbox. I placed the box in and hurried back inside. Like clockwork. Just after first it showed up. Under the streetlight, I could see a crooked smile spread across its pale face as it opened the box and looked inside. It scurried off into the darkness, and I collapsed into my bed. I checked my wallet when I woke up and the $4,250 was paid to my Bitcoin address. The following email was short like the rest. Delicious. We like it. One more liter next Tuesday. There was no way I could give another liter, especially with just over a week to recover. On waking up, I felt weak and fatigued. I replied back to the email. Hey, I need some time to recover. I might be able to do it again next month. 
Almost instantly after sending it, I got a reply. It read, No, one leer next Tuesday, or else. I felt my stomach sink. What does it mean by, or else? This thing is clearly deranged if it's eating blood, so I have no idea what it's capable of. I sent an email back saying sorry, and that I can't do it. A few seconds later, it replied with the same message demanding one leader again or else. I left my computer at that point. There was nothing more I could do. The week passed and ID felt drained across most of it. Just low energy and occasional head spins. It came to the Tuesday, and I didn't draw any blood. I sat by my window in the dark as it one o'clock ticked over. Out from the darkness I watched it scurry to the neighbor's letterbox. I opened the top and paused for a moment. It started to push some of the letters inside around with agitation as if it was digging under them to see if anything was there. It stopped and stared up to the sky and let out a loud raspy hiss that cut through the quiet night as if it was yelling in anguish. It looked around and stepped away from the letterbox. It looks like it didn't get what it wanted. I told it in the email. There was nothing I could do for it this week. It took a step further towards the street, and just as I was about close the curtain it stopped and starred straight at my window. I froze and tried not to move. All my lights were off, so there was no way it could see me. Its pale face and long white fingers dangling out of the baggy black hoodie faced me for what felt like an eternity. I was frozen in fear. Whatever this thing was, it was not human. It turned its head again but the neighbor on the far side's house. It paused for a few moments and then started walking straight across my neighbor's front lawn towards his house. I couldn't see it anymore from my bedroom window. So I ran out of my room into my shower window where I could see out to the neighbor's side yard. I looked out and it was climbing up the side of the neighbor's house in a fluid motion. Its hand seemed to just stick to the wall as it pulled itself up. It reached a window and I heard the glass smash as it punched it in and pulled itself through. Moments later I heard my nay start screaming. It started as him yelling for it to get out of his house and then quickly shifted to incoherent screams of terror. And then, bang. 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 I heard as the terrified screams continued with three small flashes lighting up behind the window. The screaming raised to a shrill high pitch, and then stifled out, and it was silent. I started from my shower window to the neighbor's window frozen. Was it dead? That was three gunshots. No lights were turning on in the house. I stood there frozen, paralyzed in fear. Two minutes passed and its long white fingers came from inside the room gripping the windowsill. It lowered itself effortlessly out and back to the yard and ran off through the backyard and into the woods behind. I could hear sirens slowly growing louder, and in the corner of my eye I could see several lights on the street had switch on. The noise would have woken the whole neighborhood. I starred at the woods. I could feel it was there, just on the edge of the darkness. The sound of sirens had now turned to flashing lights and I turned my gaze to the front of the property. Two police cars had pulled up and there was a small crowd of people in their pajamas gathering out the front to see what was going on. I threw some shoes on and went out my front door and joined the crowd. Everyone was startled and repeating to each other they heard screaming and gunshots. Four police officers forced the doors, there was no response and it entered the house. There was some yelling inside the house and one of the officers came out and told everyone to clear back as he called in for an ambulance and back up. A few more police cars showed up and they started to run crime scene tape around the front yard and push everyone back. I was close enough to see when the ambulance wheeled him out. He was completely pale and looked unnaturally thin. The whole side of his neck was ripped open like it was attacked by some kind of wild animal. I listened into the paramedics as they were talking to one of the officers after loading him into the back of the ambulance. The paramedics were saying they have never seen anything like it before. They said he was almost completely exsanguinated, like his blood had just dried up and disappeared. Several neighbors were talking to the police about what they heard, and I overheard an officer tell one that there is no sign of bullet holes in any of the walls. But there are casings, so the home invader must have been shot and is likely wounded which means it's likely the police will catch whoever it was. This was giving the neighborhood some reassurance, and the police seemed confident saying this. But I watched it pull itself out of the window. It looked like it was in no pain, 
and not injured at all. It made its way effortlessly out of the window, down the house, and without as much as a limp escaped into the woods. Now would have been the time to tell the police everything, but I knew that this was my fault. I gave it his address. I put the blood in the letterbox. I had it keep coming back. Am I an accessory to this? A police officer asked me if I had any information that could help, and I just mumbled I heard gunshots and yelling. I quickly made my way back home. I locked the doors and went to bed. It was a restless night. The following morning I checked my emails, and there was only one new one, and it was from the creature. I shook as I read it. Your neighbor was not as delicious. One liter next Tuesday or your next. No more pay. Feed me or die. I emailed it back. I made it an offer. A way for me to live and be free of it. I can't give it one liter of my blood every week. I just can't. It's Saturday as I'm writing this. I still feel weak and I don't know if I can draw much more blood for it. I'm reaching out here for help. If anyone has ab negative blood, I will buy your blood for Bitcoin. Just message me where you live in your Bitcoin wallet address. Leave a 100 milliliters vial in your letterbox before midnight on Tuesday. Ill organize for it to be collected.